And now it's time for the Everlasting Gospel. Welcome to the Everlasting Gospel. The Apostle John said that he saw an angel in heaven having the Everlasting Gospel, Revelation 14, 6. This program emphasizes the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Even as Romans 1 and verse 16 declares, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Thank you for your interest in the program. My name is Gary McDade, and I'm the host for the program. In our study today, we're going to be taking a look at a statement that Jesus made to his hearers, wherein he urged them to see the value of the Scriptures. And he gave them a big responsibility when it came to the Scriptures. In our time, often it is a responsibility that is handed off to others, and it cannot be so. Jesus will say in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. So there is a searching of the scriptures that our Lord himself requires. The full sentence is, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Notice, search. There you have a verb in the imperative mood. It is not optional. It is required for Jesus' disciples to be doing some searching. That which they are to search is the Scriptures. That would be the inspired Word of God. We have the Scriptures in the forms of the Old and New Testament today. They are neither to be added to nor taken away from. Revelation 22, 18, and 19, they are to be searched. The disciple of Christ must search the scriptures. Notice that he says to his hearers, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. Now the people to whom Jesus was speaking thought they were confident about having eternal life and they realized that the scriptures were the word of God, but they were not searching them as they should and thought they had eternal life when that point is the point under consideration in Christ's comments to them when he says, in them ye think ye have eternal life. You need to be searching these scriptures so you know what you're talking about. He adds, they are they which testify of me. That is, the scriptures are the body of material that give the evidentiary basis for our faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Well, in this one passage of Scripture, then, we see how important the Scriptures are and of our assigned responsibility and need to be studying and searching and reading those Scriptures. Our eternal life is really hanging in the balance here. And unless we search the Scriptures, we may be putting our eternal life in jeopardy. Now, the approach of our study today will be a little bit different. What I'd like to do is to take a look at six or seven points of commonly held belief and teaching in the religious world today. And I would like for us to search the scripture on each of those points. There will be much that we can say about each one of the points, but we'll just search the scriptures enough to see whether or not these things are so. Let's begin by noticing in regard to searching the scriptures, as Jesus is speaking to his disciples, if you search the scriptures, will you find, for example, and this is our first point, once saved, always saved. We hear a lot about this teaching. Once saved, always saved. Is that what the Bible teaches? When you search the scriptures, what do you find? Just notice in a broad way, a clear-cut way in searching the scriptures, something that you know about the scriptures. Judas was not only a disciple of Jesus, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was selected after a night of prayer on our Lord's part. In Luke 6, verse 12, he is named among the other 11 in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. Judas was a disciple of Christ. If ever there was somebody who was in a right relationship with the Lord, certainly it would be one of his apostles. And in Acts chapter 1, we find Judas by transgression fell. Now there, Luke is just simply recalling what had happened with Judas. He had sold Christ to the chief priests and the elders for 30 pieces of silver. And he, by that transgression, fell from grace. So what about once saved, always saved? That is certainly not true with Judas. There are many other personal examples that could be given, but I'd like to give you a passage of Scripture in Galatians 5 in verse 4. 
In this passage of Scripture, the apostle says, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Oh, it is possible for a person to be lost. Once a person is saved, he cannot always be saved. If he were to go back and be justified by the law of Moses in some aspect of his life, he would be fallen from grace. So there's a passage of scripture as we search that shows you the problem with this commonly held teaching of once saved, always saved. There's another passage of scripture for your consideration, not often mentioned in this connection, but equally powerful, that I'd like to share with you from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. Here the apostle is talking about the apostle's responsibility to convey and communicate the teaching of Christ accurately and precisely. And then he calls attention to the general principle of stewards, those who are put in charge of other people's possessions to manage and care and protect them. In verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 4, Paul said, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So there you'll have a requirement. What is that requirement? It's the requirement of stewards to be found faithful. We as Christians have a responsibility that we must live up to in order to be acceptable to God. The idea of once we're saved, we're always saved is certainly not the teaching of these verses. This passage in Searching the Scripture shows that you will find if you search the Scripture that once saved, always saved, didn't come from the scriptures. And then there's one more verse I'd like to give you because I think it's a kind of a summary verse of the contents of an entire book of the New Testament. That book is Hebrews. That verse is chapter chapter is verse 3 and the verse is verse 12. Here I think you have an overview of Hebrews in one particular verse showing the purpose of the book. Look what he says. He writes to these Jewish Christians in Jerusalem Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Notice that he is writing to brethren. Now, sometimes people who believe in once saved, always saved will say this. They'll say, well, if a person is clearly a reprobate and he was once considered a Christian, he never was saved. That's what they always say. This passage eliminates that possibility because he says, take heed, brethren. Not only is this the observation of the writer, this is a statement from the Holy Spirit inspiring that writer. The Holy Spirit couldn't be confused or mistaken about who would be receiving this lesson and this letter. It would be brethren. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Why the warning if it was not possible? Oh, it was possible, as we've seen from other verses of Scripture. So, searching the Scriptures, do you find once saved, always saved? The answer is, no, you do not. You find that the Christian must be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, to receive the crown of life. Also, searching the Scriptures, will you find grace only? Again, we're looking at popular teachings, and grace only has been a popular teaching all the way back to the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, salvation by grace alone. Grace is always paired with faith and works in our New Testament. For example, in Ephesians 2.8, are we saved by grace? Absolutely. Are we saved by grace only? Let's see what the Bible says. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Notice, faith and grace and good works are paired with grace in order for that grace to be salvation and bring salvation. Are we saved by grace alone? No. People persist in saying that. It's one of the reasons why most of the people in our world today won't take a serious look at religion. It is because the teachers in religion are teaching this popular doctrine. We're saved by grace alone. And then they will turn around and say, we're saved by faith alone. And they know that two things alone would be contradictory. We could be saved by one or we could be saved by the other, but we can't be saved by both of them alone. We need to understand 
that grace is always paired with faith and good works in order for a person to be saved. If that was the consistent message being presented to the world, people would appreciate Christianity more. They are repelled by contradiction because they know a contradiction implies a lie. Now, before we leave this topic, I'd like to notice Titus 2 with you. Titus 2, starting with verse 11. Here the Apostle Paul is talking about the manifestation of God's saving grace. And I want you to see what it does and what it obligates. Here you go. This is Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the appearance of God's saving grace has taught us it is the grace of God that we can be taught the Word of God. And in so doing, there are things we need to deny and there's a way that we need to live. That is the expression of God's grace. So in searching the Scriptures, will we find salvation by grace only? No, you will not. Also in searching the Scriptures, will you find the sinner's prayer? Now, you can find the sinner's prayer in little tracks like this one right here. You can find the sinner's prayer toward the back of that little track. And this man, I've talked to him about the sinner's prayer. He doesn't have a verse of scripture for the sinner's prayer. He's a little embarrassed about it in personal conversation because he'll say, you don't have to say the sinner's prayer. I ask, well, then why do you publish this track and keep publishing and distributing this track? And it's really not what you tell me now that you believe, that you have to pray the sinner's prayer. Why, you don't have to pray the sinner's prayer to be saved. The sinner's prayer goes something like this. It's not even concluded in Jesus' name. So the sinner's prayer. People are saying you're saved by accepting Jesus and praying the sinner's prayer. The objective of the searcher of scriptures would be to be accepted of Christ. Not us accept him, but him accept us. See 2 Corinthians 5, 9. So are we saved by the sinner's prayer? Can we search the scripture and find out definitively what it says about that? Yes. In John 9 and verse 31, the Bible says, we see that God does not hear the prayers of sinners. Notice that. He does not hear the the prayers of sinner. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he hears. So the Bible has told us God doesn't hear sinner's prayers. And yet, it is a common teaching in religion today, pray the sinner's prayer. Search the scriptures, Jesus said, and then you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. Also in this connection, I'd like to notice 1 Peter 3.12 with you. In 1 Peter 3.12, the apostle says, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, note that, and his ears are open unto their prayers, note that, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, note that. Who's God for? Who, with, with whom will God abide and listen? The righteous. Well, who are the ones he will not listen to? Those who are against him, those who are not doing properly, those who are against him by doing evil. I want you to notice that as you search the scriptures, not only do you not find an instance of the sinner's prayer, but you find that the Bible teaches God does not hear the prayers of sinners. Now, we're not left without hope in this regard. This is not to say that people are lost. No, we teach and advance the cause of Christ in the obedience to the gospel. That is done through hearing the word of God and believing it. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It is accomplished by repenting of past sins. The goodness of God leads us to repentance, Romans 2, 4. It is done by confessing the name of Christ unto salvation, Romans 10, 9, and 10, and by being baptized into Christ, Romans chapter 6, verse 3, being added to the church by the Lord, Acts 2, 47, Romans 16, 16. That's how one becomes a Christian. You search the scriptures and that's what you find in that connection. So this is a large teaching on the part of many about the sinner's prayer. And in searching the scriptures, we don't find the sinner's prayer. We can go to the book of Acts and find 10 case studies of conversion where every last person was baptized, but we can't find one person praying as a sinner for his salvation as is taught by so many. 
Also, when searching the scriptures, will you find join the church of your choice? I want you to notice a verse of scripture as we search the scriptures this time. It is Matthew chapter 16. In verse 16, Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The affirmation of belief of Jesus as God's Son is made by Peter's confession. In verse 18, Jesus says to him, And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus said he would build his church. Notice the singularity. He didn't say, I'll build two or 2,000 churches. He said, I'll build my church. It is referenced as the kingdom of heaven. Same reading. So now you'll find, do we join the church of our choice? Not when Jesus built a church. Notice also that in Acts chapter 2, that believing multitude guilty of having crucified the Christ and convinced so by the preaching of the gospel, as recorded from the sermon of Peter in Acts 2, cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They are told, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That's what they were told. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47 has them praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we see in two passages, 41 and 47 in Acts 2, they didn't join a church. They gladly received his word and they were added, passive action, were added and we find in verse 47, by whom they were added to the church, by the Lord himself. You don't join a church. When you search the scriptures, and we are thinking now of people who are saying, join the church of your choice, that does not find support in the scriptures. What does find support is obeying Christ and having him add that person to his church that he built. That's the way he built his church, is by adding souls to it that obey the teaching that he gave and the teaching given through his authorized apostles. I want you to notice something else about this. Today, what is a common practice is for people who want to join a church to go up before the church when called upon and to say, I want to be a member of this church and then a leader will get up and say, we have a person who wants to join our church today. Everybody that is for him, say aye. And then there's usually a rumbling of eyes. Everybody opposed, say nay. Okay, did you hear any nays? Therefore, you will be accepted into the membership of this church. Sometimes they have a caveat upon further investigation or receiving of a letter from somewhere else. But nonetheless, I want you to notice what happens. Your membership, in that church, it didn't depend on God and his word. It depended on man. Jesus said, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Such efforts as that are vain or empty. We don't join the church of our choice. We obey the gospel and the Lord adds us to his. Also, we find a lot of times people saying, Trust your heart. So when we search the scriptures, will you find where the Bible says, trust your heart? That's what a lot of people are saying. You know, I, I know I'm saved. I feel it in my heart. Look, I trust my heart. I know God knows my heart and I trust my heart. In the book of Jeremiah, there's a passage I think everybody needs to see. Because as we search the scriptures, we find the inspired Jeremiah making this statement. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to his doings. Do you notice that? While some are saying, trust your heart. I believe in my heart. I feel in my heart. The Bible is saying the heart can be deceitful above all things and exceeding wicked. Who can know it? 
And also you'll notice the basis upon which one might find acceptability with God is to understand that truth because the Lord is searching the hearts and he's going to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So it's important not to just think something but to do it. Now the reason this becomes so important is because people will say, you know, I realize that I'm not perfect and I do things that are not really good. I curse a little whatever they want to say that they're doing that they know is not good. But here's what they'll say. The Lord knows my heart. The Lord is looking at what you do. Not only is he looking at your heart, he's looking at what you do. And you're saying, well, I trust my heart that the Lord knows I'm well-intentioned. I don't really mean to be offensive. I don't really mean to do anything out of line. But since I do... I trust my heart. The Lord is going to be looking at my heart. He's looking at what you do, at your ways. He's examining your doings. So you can't really trust your heart. The Bible says in, in Psalms 19 verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. What are you trusting now, your heart or the word? If you hide the word of God in your heart, you're not trusting your heart because it can be deceitfully wicked. You are trusting the word of God. In the New Testament, in Colossians 3.16, Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So in searching the scriptures, do you find trust your heart? No, you do not. Do you find the awarding of religious titles as you search the scripture? Now, there's a common teaching and a common practice in our day, that of the awarding of religious titles, much sought after in some quarters. For this searching the scripture, we go back to the book of Job, Job 32. In this chapter, Elihu is speaking to Job, and at this point, Job is getting a little bit self-confident here. Later, he'll repent for it, but Elihu nails it in chapter 33, verse 21 and 22, when he advises thusly, Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man, for I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. So the awarding of these religious titles, the assigning of these flattering titles is out of harmony with the scriptures. That's Job 32, 21 and 22. Yet we find today many people calling themselves a pastor when they don't meet biblical qualifications of 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5. Yet you'll have a person, may not even be a man, the Bible requires a man. May not be a person who's married. The Bible requires a person who's married. May not be a person who's married with children. The Bible requires a person married with children. Titus chapter 1. And yet they'll take the title of pastor and want you to refer to them as pastor. It'll be a single pastor in a congregation. No. In the New Testament, there's always two pastors per congregation. A plurality. Acts 14 Verse 23, so people will like the title pastor because it sounds good. People ask me, are you the pastor of the church down there? And I'll answer no, because I know what they're asking. Am I the pastor? No, I'm not. And so you need to be clear about that. Men take the title of reverend, some women today too, yet the Bible says in Psalm 111 verse 9, holy and reverend is his name in reference to God. People will take that. There are men who will be celibate and not have any children, and yet they want all of the followers in the parish to refer to them as father. And it would be disrespectful on their part to him not to call him father. He's insisting on that. And they're taught from childhood, you refer to that priest as father. Yet Jesus said, call no man on the earth your father, for one is your father, even he which is in heaven. In Romans chapter 10, here as we search the scripture, is some more information I'd like to add to the discussion of the assigning of religious titles, the awarding of religious titles. Paul wrote, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's true of everyone who is awarded a religious title that the Bible does not support. 
The Bible encourages us to reference ourselves as brethren, as equals before the Lord. It's very important to see that. There are places and positions of service in the church that have titles connected with them, like pastor or shepherd, bishop or overseer, elder or presbyter. All of those refer to the one group of men illustrated in the verses I gave you earlier on their qualifications. There are teachers and evangelists in each congregation. And that's taught by the Bible. Those are not flattering titles. They are if someone doesn't qualify. So we're not to give flattering titles. So when you search the scripture, does will you find the awarding of religious titles? No, you won't. And then finally, we've come to denominational churches. When you search the scriptures, will you find denominational churches? For this, I would love to draw our attention to our Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17, where Jesus prayed about the unity of all his disciples. And denominational churches stand against and reject the teaching I'm about to read you out of the Bible. It's John 17, 20. Jesus is speaking. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. There is no room in the statement of the prayer of Jesus in John 17, 20 to 23 for denominational churches. A person loves those with whom he's been associated, maybe family members, maybe respected people of the past, loves them more than he does Christ, to say that denominational churches can be acceptable to God. In searching the scriptures, you don't find denominational churches. To denominate is to divide. And you don't find division being in harmony with God's will. One more verse on that is 1 Corinthians 10, verse, or chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul wrote, Now I beseech you, brethren, he's begging, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's begging by the authority of Jesus, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. When we search the scriptures, will we find denominational churches? No. What will you find? The Church of Christ, Romans 16, 16, that goes back to the first century, right there in that text. That's what you find. And we can be members of that church today, if we but will, humbly submit to the teachings of the scriptures. Our Lord taught us to search the scriptures. This program has been brought to you by the Browns Ferry Road Church of Christ and sister congregations in the area and interested individuals. We appreciate their interest and support and we appreciate you tuning in today. And we hope that the lesson of our study has been an admonition for us to continue to search the scriptures. In them we find eternal life which we so desire. We hope and trust that you will continue to watch the everlasting gospel Tell others about it and come see us when you can at the Browns Ferry Road Church of Christ. You'll find a warm and friendly, loving group of Christians who worship in spirit and in truth to greet you. We pray that all of the blessings of heaven may be yours and that we'll find them in the scriptures and enjoy them. Thank you for being with us today.